Wonderful. Good morning, Central Church. It's so good to be here with you. I send you greetings from the administration, faculty, staff, and students of Coralwood Adventist Academy. I can't believe I'm headed into my third year, so I've been here two years, and I haven't been here to preach yet. So I'm excited to be here as your head elder. So... um, articulated. When I was a little girl, I would listen to the sermons at my church, and then I would go home and preach them in my bathroom, re-preach them rather, because I felt I can do a better job, and so I would re-preach them in the mirror, I remember distinctly, and I just knew that God had a purpose and a plan for me in some way, shape, or form to be up front, and in fact, When I was a little girl, I wanted very badly to be a pastor, and I thought that that's what I was going to do. Um, At the time, wasn't so smiled upon for a female to be a pastor, and so I went into law. So I was pre-law all the way through um, my undergraduate, and that's where um, God got a call on my heart and a call on my life for a very different track. So... Last week, I met with our grade 9 to 12 students. I did some academic advising with them. And the very first question I asked them was, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? And they all had these, you know, big ideals and, you know, doctor, lawyer, and they're throwing out this and that pediatric nurse and all of these good things. And I said to them, I said, wonderful. I said, okay, so, so let's get you on the right track to go down this direction. And uh, I, 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 I encourage them and, yes, have goals and dreams and, and hopes and pursue them with passion. And so I challenged them, but I also said this. I said, but please, I ask you one thing, to leave room for God, that you never know the path or the call he may have upon your life. And yes, we are to map things out. I challenge them to map things out, to know where you're going. But you never know when God may put a twist in the road. You never know. And so I said, please be open for that call. Um, Because maybe he has a different plan. And if I've learned one thing in my life, it's this. That never more are you content. Never more are you the happiest. Never more are you at peace than when your life is in sync with God. And so I challenge them to leave room for him. I have to confess a secret. I see money down here. I don't know. Some children must have dropped it. You know, I've preached any number of times, and I always forget to bring money up onto the platform with me. This morning I did. (laughs) I remembered, and I have it tucked here in my Bible, and nobody came to get it. (laughs) And that's probably smart, because I've preached I don't know how many times, and I never remember to bring it up on the platform with me, but I'll drop it in once I finish. So today I've entitled the message, Sealed. Sealed. Um, And I've entitled it this for a very specific reason. And we're going to find out as we journey together for just a little bit this morning. So please, at this time, if you could bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Gracious Father God in heaven, as we come before you this morning, entering into your divine presence, that, Father God, you will wipe away every thought from our minds, every care from our hearts, that we will be able to fellowship and reflect together, that, Father God, We will admit before you as a congregation, as a church, that all honor and glory belongs to you. And I pray, dear God, that you might take a piece of coal from the refiner's fire and touch my lips, that it might not be me that this congregation sees, Father, but that it might be you and your words. And I ask this in your most precious and holy name, amen. I'm going to talk to you about something dear to my heart. And of course, Adventist education will be woven into this sermon. But I'm going to start with this. 
What does this word sealed mean? Well, you see, God desires you to be sealed. Every single one of us, he desires to be sealed. So before we can really get to the heart of what I want to talk about, we need to flesh out what does this word sealed mean? And in particular, what does the word sealed mean in God's word? As his instruction, as Paul talks about through his letters, what does the word sealed mean? And the scripture reading today was 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. And it says this, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit, here's the catch, the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The Spirit in our hearts. Thank you for that amen. When we read the Word of God, there's power in the Word of God. We'll get to that quote in just a little bit. Another verse that talks about being sealed says this, You were marked in Him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of His glory. So we have that word sealed again, both times, sealed. Do you notice what is in connection with the word sealed? The Spirit. In the first one, 2 Corinthians, it said the Spirit. In this one, it says Holy Spirit. One in the same. And so in order to be sealed by God, there needs to be, in essence, a Spirit that is sealing us. Is this correct? Yes. So there needs to be a spirit that is sealing us, that consumes and connects us to the heart of God. When you take a look at at, at biblical times, there was a seal that would be placed on, say, an envelope or a letter. This seal oftentimes signified something very important, whether it came from a king whether it came from a priest or a minister in in the land, the seal was vitally important. And the reason it was important was because it denoted four things. Number one, security. Number two, authenticity. Number three, ownership. And number four, authority. So these four elements we can find within the biblical pages, within the Bible pages. And the first one we look at is security. Now, when you take a look, and you can turn here if you want to Daniel 6.17, but I'm going to just give you a little synopsis. You have King Darius, and he has written a decree. His wise men have manipulated him. And he has written a decree that goes out across all the land. That what is supposed to happen? That basically, you are to pray only to him. Now, of course, this was designed for Daniel. Because those wise men were jealous. And Daniel was known to pray before his God with his window open three times a day, faithfully. And so they wondered, is Daniel going to hide in the closet? What is he going to do? Is he not going to pray? No, we know the story. We know the childhood Bible story. Daniel kneels before his window and prays before his God. And so he is thrown into a lion's den. Now, King Darius calls that while Daniel is in there in the lion's den, that where he is is supposed to be sealed. That it is not to be broken unless he breaks it. He's a sense of security. He doesn't want Daniel touched by anybody else. He doesn't want Daniel harmed by anybody else. He wants to see if Daniel's God is going to save him. And Daniel's God does. Of course God shows up in a big way. And he, and he saves him. That was the first thing King Darius did. Is in the morning time, he ran down. To the lion's den, and he, 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 you know, the seal is broken because it has been secure all night. Daniel has been in there. And the seal is broken, and he says, Daniel, are you in there? If 
from the depths of the lion's den comes the voice. My God has saved me. I am here. But security. Another one, Jesus' tomb. When Jesus was crucified, he was placed in a tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And he was placed in a tomb. And do you remember what they did? They sealed his tomb, right? Security. He's not getting out. Right? His disciples aren't going to sneak in to take his body away. And so they seal the tomb because they don't want him to get out. Security. And so when you are sealed, there is a sense of security that God offers us. You see, in this life, my friends, we think that money brings us security. We think that a retirement plan, right, 401k, is that what it is here, or RRSPs? Yes. That if we have RRSPs and we have built up lots of money so that we can retire, that's a sense of security. In this life, we think that if we have a good husband or wife who's not going to cheat on us, that's a sense of security. But dare I say, let God be the one who provides for your life, not money. Dare I say, let God be the husband or the wife of your heart and your soul. Because he's meant to be our first love. Beyond anything temporal on this earth. And so, firstly, to be sealed gives a sense of security. Second, after security, we have a sense of authenticity that comes with a sealing. I mean genuine, that it's authentic, that it's real, that it's not fake. And so the story I have here is found in 1 Kings 21, 6 to 16, and it's about King Ahab. Oh, bad King Ahab. King Ahab and his wicked queen Jezebel. And it's about Naboth. King Ahab and Jezebel and Naboth. And you see, King Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. He wanted his lands. King Ahab was a jealous king. He wanted his lands. But he was a coward. And so Jezebel took King Ahab's seal, and she dispersed letters to all the nobles and told them basically to gang up on Naboth. And so this took place. They wrote, they, they basically said that he was deceitful and dishonest, and Naboth was killed as a result, and Ahab claimed his vineyards. The seal that was sent out, however, was it King Ahab who sent out this notice to the nobles with the seal? No. It was not. However, she sent out these letters in King Ahab's name with his seal. So automatically, the men thought, well, this is King Ahab. This is an order given by our king, a decree by him. We must follow it. And they did. Why? Because there was a certain sense of authenticity. That the seal couldn't come from anybody else. It could only come from King Ahab. And so there's a certain sense of authenticity or genuineness or real, not fake, that comes with being sealed. Thirdly, so we have first security, second authenticity, and thirdly, ownership. Who do you belong to? Ownership. Jeremiah, King Zedekiah, and the land from Anathoth. Jeremiah 32.10, if you would like to go there, you may go there. Jeremiah 32.10, or you can take pictures and look up these stories later this afternoon. It's a good afternoon activity to do a little bit more research and study. But you're looking at ownership. 
And you see, Jeremiah was told specifically to purchase land. And when he purchased this, this land, it was with a seal. And when he purchased the land in Anathoth with this seal, then that land officially became his. He possessed it. There was a sense of ownership there in that he possessed this land because it had been sealed that he possessed it. Today, maybe we purchase a house. And with that house or piece of land comes what? A deed. My family, I was raised on a farm in New Brunswick, a huge 300-acre farm in New Brunswick, absolutely beautiful on the water. Still today, I go back, and this is where my family resides. It is our, what we consider to be our earthly legacy here on earth, our inheritance on earth, and it's absolutely beautiful. Well, unbeknownst to us, that just a little bit down the way from our land was another piece of property that my grandfather had been paying on for years and years and years. And he had a deed to it, a full deed, maybe 20 acres. Well, then all of a sudden, a call comes one day, and this land is in dispute. We don't think this land necessarily belongs to you. Bring your deed, please, to the surveyor's office. Because there had been a lady in Halifax, Nova Scotia, who was paying the same taxes on the same piece of land with a deed. And so they go to the surveyors. And they take a look at this piece of property, and today the land is now divided between the two individuals. But for many, many, many years, since my great-great-grandfather purchased the land, we had been paying on it, taxes. But so had this lady both with a full deed of ownership. <coughs> Sorry. So when Jeremiah purchases this piece of land, he gets ownership. Not through a deed, but through a seal that has been placed. And so being sealed denotes ownership. Fourthly and lastly, <clears throat> authority. A seal denotes authority. And this is Haman and Queen Esther and the decree that goes out. And we're familiar with Esther 8, 8 to 12. And this decree has gone out from Haman, sealed by the king, that all of the Jews would be killed. And so Esther is able, we know the familiar story, to procure another decree. That the king, King Xerxes, another decree that he sends out. And he basically says that the Jews may stand up and fight. They may stand up for who they are, and they may fight whoever comes at them. But you see here, could the king even break his own seal? No. When he had sent out that first decree, it was sealed. It was done. Authority was given. And so it could not be broken. And so he had to send out another decree in order to attempt to counteract the first one. And so in Bible times, this essence or idea of being sealed or having a seal placed upon a document, a decree, a piece of land, having a seal placed upon a life, denoted these four elements. And so when we read back in 2 Corinthians and when we read back in Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, when we read back in these verses where it talks about a seal upon our lives, God is talking about a very specific type of seal that denotes all four of these entities. So number one, whose authority has sealed us? God's authority, right? God's authority has sealed us. Who has ownership of our lives? God has ownership of our lives. Help me. What's the next one? What is it? 
security was the first one. So when we are sealed by God, whose security do we have? He secures our life. And the final one, authenticity, right? And that's where the question of us comes into play. Are we authentic? God says, I place my seal upon you because I desire to protect you and to give you security. God says, I place my seal upon you because I desire to own every part of your life because I love you. I love you with a love that no other love can compare to. An agape, unconditional love. God says, I place my seal upon you that I have authority over your life and you have authority as a Christ believer in me. But then the question of authenticity comes. God is authentic, my friends. I can tell you I've seen him, I've experienced him in my own life. I've seen how he's worked. He is authentic. But then the question is then placed upon us, are we authentic? Do we authentically every day in everything that we do, everything that we say and everything that we think, do we authentically represent our God? Because no matter if you're working for the church, no matter if you are working out in the secular world, wherever you may be working, that authenticity should be a part of who you are and what you represent to whoever you come in contact with. And so the authenticity in particular goes both ways. And that's where it leads very quickly for me to the role. What I feel our role is, and I'm going to read this to you, and it's very small there, so I'm going to turn around and look up here. God's holy educating spirit is in his word. A light, a new and precious light shines forth from every page. Truth is the revealed and words and sentences are made bright and appropriate for the occasion as the voice of God speaking to them. We need to recognize the Holy Spirit as our enlightener. That spirit loves to address the children and discover to them the treasures and beauties of the word. The promises spoken by the great teacher will captivate the senses and animate the soul of the child with a spiritual power that is divine. They will grow in the respective mind, a familiarity with divine things, which will be as a barricade against the temptations of the enemy. Can I get an amen? amen. Those are powerful words. I belong to a Facebook page entitled Child Guidance. And every day, this one woman, I, I don't know who she is. Her name is Shelly Anchata. I don't know who she is. I, I believe she's a friend of one of my um, best friends who lives in uh, North Carolina. I just happened to see, and my best friend who lives in Tennessee, Tina Chabot, I happened to see both of them liking this child guidance page one day. So I go on to it, and every day this woman posts spiritual elements from child guidance. And I came across this one day, and it just hit me. As an Adventist educator of young minds, it just nailed me between the eyes. And I tell my teachers that whether you're teaching math, whether you're teaching language arts, whether you're teaching science, whether, whatever you may be teaching, that there needs to be an object lesson that is applied, number one, a Christ object lesson. And number two, biblical principles should be steadfast throughout your lesson. Vitally important. And when you read this, that the Spirit loves. Now, let me tell you something. If you've ever read Sister White, and, and, and you know that she is not a woman of extremes, right? That she is oftentimes very balanced in her writing, very balanced. And she rarely uses the words hate and love. It's, it's always a balance. And she rare, I think I've seen in, in her writings maybe one exclamation point that I've come across. So she rarely uses those exclamatory type of, of words or, or even punctuation. But here she says, that spirit, now that's a capital S, so that's the spirit of God. And what are we sealed by? Spirit of God. And she says here, that spirit loves 
to address children. Loves. To me, the word loves is a longing for. Let me tell you, my husband, um, Mr. Fajeda, he did Sabbath school at South today. And so I got them ready. We, they got out the door, and he did Sabbath school at South. And he, he made the trek. As soon as he was done Sabbath school, he made the trek over here. And I was sitting up here in this chair, and I saw him and my daughter come right there, right to those doors. And I can see through your doors. So I saw them come, and my daughter has her cute little pink dress on and her little, her little I don't know, what is this called, beret? Her little beret that she has on in pink. And I looked out the door, and whew, my heart, love, right? And automatically, I've, I've only been a mom for five and I think it's three-quarter months now, almost six months. Um, although I say before I had Sophia, my, my constituent people and my parents would always ask, how many children do you have? And I would say, oh, you know, 180, 185, <laughs> somewhere in there. <laughs> and so I've always considered Adventist education being a part of it, um, my, my love. But when I look out there and I, I see my little Sophia, and it just love, and I have this longing for her, to hold her. When she's gone from me for any period of time, I miss her. Have any of you ever experienced that with your children, with your loved ones? I miss her. And so this, when, when Sister White says here that that spirit loves to address the children and discover to them the treasures and beauties of the word, the promises spoken by the great teacher will captivate the senses and animate the soul of the child with a spiritual power that is divine. God longs to impress upon our children his spiritual divine power and to see that manifested in their lives, in what they do, where they go, the choices they make the way they stand. And I don't know if any of you have looked around at our world today or taken the temperature of our times, but I believe with all of my heart that things are winding down very quickly. And that time on this earth is not much longer. And my friends, I can't tell you if that's five years, if that's 10 years, if that's 20 years, if that's 50 years, I don't know. I can't tell you that. It's not my place. But I can tell you what I've studied in prophecy. I can tell you what I've read. And I can tell you what I've experienced and seen in this world. And I believe with all of my heart, and maybe it's the longing I have to go home, but I believe with all of my heart that God is coming quickly. And as I deal on the front lines with our young people and with our children, I see what they're faced with on a daily basis. And I'm going to read to you something. And you tell me if this sounds even just a little bit like your life. Their convention was the largest the world had ever seen. From every corner of the earth came the delegates. And for as long as they can remember, he has been their leader. Listen up, you devils. You aren't going to keep the Christians from going to their churches. We must change our tactics if we are going to enjoy continued success. Teach them that happiness comes from things and induce the husbands to work 8, 10, 12 hours a day, 7, 8, whatever we can get, days of a week. Make them work two jobs if necessary. Make it appear a necessity for the wives to work out of the home. Tell them there is just no other way if they are going to maintain the lifestyle they want for their families. Then get the wives to work long, hard hours, coupled with the home responsibilities, so they have absolutely no left at the end of the day for their husbands and their children. Overstimulate their minds so they cannot hear Jesus whispering to their consciences. Bombard their senses with music played in every home, workplace, and store. Make sure the bad news hits them every day, wherever they turn. Central Church, does this sound a little bit like the world that we live in? Let me continue. Use newspaper, magazines, radio, and television 24 hours a day. 
corrupt the moral fabric of their marriages and their young people by placing sensual images that invite impure thoughts on billboards, in movies, newspapers, or magazine covers, and of course, on television. Use TV talk shows to parade the most deviant members of society through their living rooms. Have them hungrily feast upon the sordid details of immoral behavior until they begin to see evil as just another alternative. Have them dwell on the trash, trivia, and trouble of the world. Detail the misdeeds of the rich and the famous. Distract them from serious realities of life by vain hopes with sweepstakes, lotteries, and gambling casinos. Fill their shelves with books, magazines, and still more books. These represent time, and more time spent here is less time spent with God. Edmonton Central Church, does this sound like your life? Does this sound like our world? Fill their homes with computers and send them out on an electronic highway where we control most of the exits, he says. Send them lots of emails, bog them down in span of never-ending information. Give them laptop computers so they can always be at work. Make sure everyone has a cell phone, even children. Fill their days with phone calls. Give them cordless cellular phones so it's easy to talk all the time. Make sure their answering machine runs over with messages. Even in their recreation, let them be excessive. Edmonton Central Church, does this sound like our world? Does this sound like your life? Send them on expensive vacations. Have them go, 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 go. Have them return from their recreation exhausted, disquieted, and unprepared for the coming week. Don't let them go out into nature. Send them to amusement parks, sporting events, concerts, and movies instead. Make this saying their motto, vacation makes them tired enough to go back to work and poor enough that they have to. You see, time is our greatest, enemy, our greatest weapon and our greatest friend, my colleagues. Let us use it wisely and let them sleep in their deceptions just a little bit longer. Then both the world and the church will be ours. Mm. And we will have won an everlasting victory. Go forth, my friends, to victory. Then with both hands raised, Satan exhorts his minions. On to victory, on to victory, until at last only the echo, only the, echo res, uh, the results of that climactic meeting filter down to us today. Evil angels went eagerly to their assignments, causing Christians everywhere to get busy, 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 and to rush, rush, rush. We're not living simple lives, my friends. Our lives are too congested. The whole system is overstimulated. And has the devil been successful in his scheme? The plan has worked beyond his wildest dreams. Satan has managed to get the whole world aboard a fast-moving train. He is unwilling to slow down, and no one can get off. Edmonton Central Church, does this sound like the world we live in? Are you exhausted? Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you go, go, go? Do you have time in your life to be authentic for God? Brian and I were heading home on Wednesday night from the school. And I'll be honest with you, we were heading home at about 11 o'clock at night. And we were talking on the phone. I was in one car with Sophie and he was in the other. And we were talking on Bluetooth. Don't worry. We were talking on, on, on Bluetooth together. And we said, where's the balance? <laughs> We've got to find a balance. Where is the balance in our life? We've got to discover it. We've got to find it. How do we find it? But you know what? I came across this. And it's about John Wesley. Not our John Wesley. A different John Wesley. But still John Wesley. And it said this, and I guess here's the question. There's lots of things to take our distraction and our attention. There's lots of things to occupy our minds and our time in today's day and age. But can we occupy our time too much with God's ministry? I don't know. Let me tell you what John Wesley says. This is John Wesley, and he, he wrote in his journal at the age of 83, my friends, the age of 83. Is anybody 83 in here? 83. Anybody? Anybody in their 80s? Anybody? There we go. 
So he says at, at, at the ripe young age of 83, he says this, that he was angry at his doctor because he wouldn't let him preach more than 14 times in a week. Are you kidding me? <laughs> he was angry at his doctor. John, 14 times. That's all you can preach this week. No more. And then, at the age of 86, he writes this in his journal. Laziness is creeping in. There's an increasing tendency to stay in bed after 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> 5.30 in the morning! And he says he's lazy! So I guess the question is, we're sealed by God. We belong to him. His ownership is stamped upon us. So we are, are, are sealed by God. Let's continue on here. I, I get a little bit passionate. I forget about my slides. So we are sealed by God. His ownership is stamped upon us. His security he gives us. His authority is ours. We are his. His authenticity is real, and he calls us to be real. And so when I take a look at this, we can fill our lives with so much chaos in this world. But then are you going to have the time to be authentically sealed by God? Or we could fill our lives as John Wesley, or our pastor John Wesley, with the ministry of God, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter where we are, no matter who we're with, fill our, ourselves with the ministry of God. And yes, be exhausted, but God promises us that I will give them what? Rest. He says, I will give you rest. Drink from my water because it will give you energy. It will give you life. Those who are weary, they will mount up on wings like eagles, right? And so when we consume ourselves with the ministry of God and we're giving and going for him, yes, we may be busy and exhausted, but I tell you our time is short and there's lots of work to be done. And so in order to be that authentic, and I guess the question I ask you is, not just are you sealed, but are you and your children sealed? And again, I segue back into Adventist education. I believe that our education system was divinely appointed by God. And it was divinely appointed for a reason. We are not special. Don't trick yourselves. Don't fool yourselves. We are not elite. It will not be only Adventists in heaven. However... We have been given a very distinct message to this world. And with that distinctness comes great responsibility. And that means that at 16 years of age, when your child is pushing you, I don't want to go to an Adventist school, you say, but I know what's best for you, and I'm your parent. Trust me, when I graduated from Kingsway College, I graduated with 3.9, and I was bound and determined to go to a public university. I graduated top of my class. I was not going to an Adventist school, hands down. I did not party. I did not drink. I was a good child. But man, I had a mouth on me. And I was strong-willed. <laughs> and my mom and I, we went like this many a times. <laughs> I'm shameful to admit now. And I was determined. But she was mom. Ask me if I went to an Adventist university. I did. Of course I did. She was not my friend. She was my parent. And God had given me to her as a gift and with a responsibility to raise me right. And so I went to Southern Adventist University. And you know what? I say this. I think that Something sucks the brains out in high school, and then all of a sudden they're given back around 1920, the ability to reason. I love my students, but I've experienced high school for many years. I'm a high school teacher by trade, 16 years, and I, I can tell you at the end of my university years, I went to my mother and I thanked her profusely. I said to her this, I never could have gotten from my religion classes what I got from Southern. I never would have gotten that from a public university. Thank you. 
thank you for making me go. It made all the difference. And you may not think, you may not think that your child is taking anything good from Adventist education because they may grumble about it. I don't know. And you may not think they're taking any good from their religion classes. But you know what? I guarantee you they're being challenged every day. I was a, a religion teacher, grade 9 and grade 11 religion teacher for many years. And I tell you that they will have engaging discussions. That they will have a right foundation given to them that couples, that complements rather what is happening in your home. And that right foundation, those, those discussions will be grabbing them and making little dents whether you realize it or not. I tell my teachers this, that you may have a conversation with a student one day about positive character choices, and you may have to have that exact same conversation the next day, but keep having it. Because it may sink in two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, I don't know, but it will sink in. It will resonate one day. It will set that foundation that they can go and grow from. And so we need to, we need to be pulling things back from our children. I've determined that Sophia will not see or interact, rather, with electronics until she's two. Maybe it will be longer because it impairs the frontal lobe, which is our moral deciding factor. Sister White says that Lucifer has no frontal lobe. She does. She does. He has, he, uh, his forehead is so receded. Our frontal lobe is our moral deciding factor within our brain. And when it is impaired, it is more difficult to make those types of moral decisions that our young people need to be making. And the overstimulation of technology, whoo, the devil is smart. And trust me, I use technology, but the devil is smart. And when we're constantly engaged with it, we're constantly on it. It's impeding right here, constant overstimulation. This isn't religion. This isn't the Bible. This is science that tells us this. And so we've got to be careful what we're placing in our lives. What is making us busy? And so the question I ask you and that I desire to leave you with is, are you and your children sealed? Does your ownership, is it the stamp of God upon your life? Authority. Who is the authority or what is the authority that you, that you obey? Is it God? And thirdly, security. Have you placed your security in him? And lastly, authenticity. He authentically says, you are mine. I love you. You are mine. I am real. But then do you authentically say, I am yours, God. And every part of my life is yours. Every part of who I am speaks to my authentic commitment to you. I leave you with the question, are you and your children sealed?
As we look up to the skies, dear Lord, as we look out to the world, dear Lord, and as we look around at the fellow members within our church, we see, dear God, that the cup is overflowing and the time is at hand. The time is at hand for us to stand in a world that promotes compromise on every angle, that has philosophies that will toss us to and fro that if we are not grounded with a foundation to be warriors for you, that, Father God, we will fall. And I pray that is not the case. I pray, dear Lord, that with everybody in this entire sanctuary this morning, that we will stand and say, we elicit all the armory of heaven to come to our defense and to come down, Father God, and to fight a victory, a battle, which has already been won. And so I pray, dear God, that as we leave this sanctuary, that we might go knowing that your spirit seals us and that we have no other choice but to choose you. And I ask this in your name. Amen. <laughs> 